Hi, and welcome to the show. I'm Leslie Choice. We're here in the rare book room at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And my first guest is Marjorie Anderson. She's edited an anthology called Drop Threads 3. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Um, I should let you describe the nature of the beast. What have you collected in this volume? <laughs> this is the third in the series of personal essays, all Canadian women and all based on life experiences, lived life experiences. Okay, what was the origin of this uh, drop thread anthology? So it has a bit of a history. Yes, it does. It's uh, the first two books uh, were collections that um, I did with my friend Carol Shields. And uh, the books actually started from conversations. They didn't start with an idea, oh, let's do a book. But we had a conversation about those areas in women's lives that are kept in silence. Uh, what is it that we dare not speak? Or what is it that we haven't heard so we're surprised by in life? And that led to such a profound interest in the topic that we thought, what about doing an anthology? So we really felt that we had tapped into a vein of stories uh, that were there, and this was just a vehicle for bringing them to the surface. Now, for this one, the third volume in particular, um, you had many submissions. What, what were you looking for, you know, in that arena? What kind of things in the stories themselves? This one had a slightly different focus. The first two were on areas of what we aren't told. And uh, I decided for this book, and it's the first one I did on my own since Carol's death, that we wanted women to consider not what we haven't been told, but what do we know and should be telling. So that's what I asked. I said, what is it that we have discovered? What are those um, personal discoveries? And wh what is it that we have to pass on? Some of them came forward in, in advice-giving pieces, but always at a slant, never anything totally direct. But the rest of them were just illumination of things that had happened in their lives. So the wisdom we get from it is just learning of another person's experience, not, a le not necessarily being told what to do. So they all have little kernels of wisdom at the heart of them. And that's what readers will get from this, are these wonderful insights that benefit all lives, I think. Okay, um, and you spread the net fairly wide. It wasn't just professional writers or published writers necessarily. No, no. We had a, right from the beginning with the first book, we decided that we wanted them to be women's stories. And of course, they had to be written. So our first access was to women who were writers and known to be writers. Uh, but we wanted it to be beyond that. We wanted it to be open to women who may not have written their stories before. So in this collection, it's similar to the other three. There are stories from well-known writers, June Colwood, uh, Judy Rebeck, uh, Margaret Atwood, and also stories from women who, some of whom have not been published before. So it's uh, a wide array. And how did you find your contributors? How did you get the word out there to people? Well, because the first two books had had done well in Canada and sold a lot that the Drop Thread series was known about. And when we decided the third one, uh, there were three ways, actually. I contacted the former contributors from the first two Drop Thread series and asked them to um, name some writers or to pass the word to these writers. We announced it in the Globe and Mail, a call for proposals, and then there is a Drop Threads website. Uh, where people can go, and it was announced there that we were taking in proposals for this third book. Right, and, and it's, it's a fine collection. I certainly found myself uh, moved by several of the writers in there um, that I was reading from these selections. Um, what did you want your male readers to think when they pick <laughs> up this book? Well, I want them to think just exactly what you just articulated, that it is a book for them too that it, this is a book about uh, life experiences. And it's largely, some of it is what it means to be female, but uh, uh, most of it is what it means to be human. And what are some of those moments in our lives that are illuminated for us forever because of the impact. And men have said that these stories are our stories too, and they really are. So I, and particularly this book, I find that men say that they they have the kind of response that you did. So it's for them too. Sometimes we women write your stories. Yes, 
Uh, I believe that, and uh, there's some great stuff in here. Now, in your foreword, however, you point out that none of the 300 plus submissions are about long-standing love relationships with men. None? None. None. Why? Only two. Only two were about it, and what it was was don't do what I did. <laughs> so it wasn't about this is how. Well, I've asked that question, and I'd be interested in hearing what you think about it. Uh, some of the responses, one person said, well, women talk about that. They, they have license to talk about their relationships, so no need to write about it. And another woman said, eh, it's not that interesting. I want to write about something that's more interesting. But it did strike me as uh, surprising. It did. Now, uh, this book, Drop Threads 3, is um, about personal truths, many versions of it. Uh, writers are telling their very concrete stories. It's not about abstract ideas. And why do you think that communicates so effectively with people? Um, because readers go there and they find themselves in it. They find there are experiences that are common to us because we're human and because we live in a world that is constructed the way it is. And um, we spend, what, over 80% of our times in our heads? And we don't often get access to what goes on in other people's heads. And, and these stories are intimate access to that material that goes on. These are things people think, things people have experienced. And so it, it brings us into a community. And as one woman reader said, when I read these stories, I don't feel so alone and I don't feel so crazy. So there's something about uh, community that is built through these stories. And really, when we think about it, that is how we establish community all the time, is by telling our stories and finding our place in community by telling our stories. And I think one of the stories maybe that, that does fit that very well, what, what you're saying there, is the one by Chantel Kreviazek. Who uh, you know, I, I really like as a singer. I enjoy you know her music and that sort of thing. And hers is very personal and um, surprising. You know, when we see people who are professionals and highly talented, you know, we get this illusion that oh, they've got it all together and this is easy for them and everything goes well. Can you give me a little bit of a snippet from hers? Yes. Some of the details. Huh? Yes. Well, she talks about how she felt some of the insecurities that she felt when she was first uh, a performer and how. Uh, if, if a fan caught her in one of her private moments, how, how horrified she felt mm -hmm. that she wasn't living up to that image. And her story, and a lot of these stories, fly in the face of that one-dimensional view of anybody. If there's a one-dimensional view of what it must be like to be famous, then her story really uh, cuts through that assumption and says that's not it. Like there are many different ways of, of being a star and there are many different facets to it. So she gave other women, and I've heard this, other young women say, I don't feel so badly about my own insecurities. If Chantel Kreviasek, who has had the kind of fame and impact on the world, uh, you know, as she has, and if she's had insecurities, then maybe they're not such a bad thing. Maybe they fuel us in directions that can be positive. And that's the wonderful thing about having some people who are well known. They allow access to their private lives, and we get to see them in a way that sometimes the tabloids or the glossy uh, magazines don't allow us to see them. Right. Um, we're going to have one of the contributors, Laurie Nielsen Glenn, on after the break, so we'll hear another voice uh, that's, that's coming from this book. As mentioned, you do include uh, some notable figures from Canadian life, Margaret Atwood and June Callwood here. I've always been interested in following what June Callwood is up to. Could you sort of tell us a little bit about June Callwood and what oh. she contributed? Oh, June Callwood is, is just the kind of woman that we all want to be, I think. And, and when I was able to have her for the first anthology, of course, I was delighted. And when we decided on this third anthology, we decided that we would have a few of the former contributors, and the publishers wanted to limit that because of having a new book. But the one, one that I really did want to have was June Colwood, that she has a kind of wisdom that goes to the heart of, of almost everybody's life. And in the story that she's written in this book, she talks about a defining moment in her life when she learned that kindness was perhaps one of the most important things that we could learn about and manifest in our own lives. And it's one of those stories that stays with you forever. 
So she has that ability, and part of it comes from the life she's lived. You know that here is the authentic woman, and here is the woman of worth and quality. And when she has something to say, it's, um, it's, it's gold. Yeah, gold is a, is a good word. I, I was all, I'm just about to ask you, how do you know when you're reading submissions that you've found gold? <laughs> I look for it. I look for the heart. That's the first thing. Someone asked me the other day what are my selection criteria, and I had to think about it because I hadn't been um, asked that before. And I look for a kernel of wisdom or a kernel of insight that I call the heart of the story. And I also look for something that is um, maybe more intangible is the, the authenticity of it, where I get that sense that this is lived experience and, and it's uh, something that will resonate in other people's lives. And then I go to the writing style. Okay. But first I go to the heart, yes. those what, little gold nuggets. What did uh, Silken Lauman have to offer? Well, I think she had to offer something that so many women uh, have to experience is how do I balance? How do I balance being a personal uh, or uh, my personal life with my professional life? Because she's known for her professional life, but she also, of course, is a mother. So she has, and that work-life balance is, is a big issue for her. And I have heard other women who don't have as large a professional life as Silken Lauman say that that's helpful to them, to see that people who have larger roles in the professional world uh, are grappling with that, that a lot of women who believe they should be professional and have the roles as mothers and homemakers, how do they balance it? And uh, I think in Silken's story there are some insights about some of the strategies that women can use to do that. Um, I was reading Harriet Hart's story of um, her alcoholism and got to the end of it and I thought, well, that's, uh, you know, from a recovered alcoholic, that's probably one of the least preachy stories that I've read of that version. How did that one find its way into the book? Uh, because in most of our lives we know people who have that and it's, I think it's sometimes a silent, it is a silent issue. And I have um, people in my life life who have that difficulty and we don't talk about it. And as a friend, I'm wondering, how can I talk about this? Because it, it should be. And when she wrote that story, I thought, here is an issue that really needs airing. And when she read it at Winnipeg, she read it before one of her friends who had been a friend for 20 years and did not know that part about her life. So that really, and, and the friend said to me after that it opened up a whole new dimension to their friendship, was being able to talk about that former aspect of her life. Uh, Marjorie, maybe I'll ask you to read a short excerpt from the book there. Is this going to be from your introduction? Yes, it is, and I'll, I'll read the first part of it, and it really outlines that first experience that I had in life that told me that I needed the stories of others in order to understand something about my place in the world and something about language. My first discovery of the universe a world can hold happened on a December night in rural Manitoba where I lived with my seven siblings and our parents. I had been at a sleepover with a cousin who lived half a mile down a bush trail. In the middle of the night, I was struck by a wave of loneliness so powerful it forced me out of bed, into my clothes, and stealthily out the door of my cousin's house. The path home, familiar in the daytime, had been transformed into foreign territory with its alternate strips of moonlight and tree shadow stretching over mounds of snow. I felt as though I had never been on that trail before, and moreover, that no one knew I was there. At that moment, I was outside every known person's awareness, and I was inside the word alone. I knew it intimately and totally. The next week in school, I learned that a classmate, an only child, had lost both parents in a boating accident immediately understood that she too had crossed over to the interior of the word alone. But with a start, I recognized that her invisible landscape was vastly different from mine. My eight-year-old mind did the transference and I was left unsure and wobbly where earlier I'd been certain I had discovered the absolute shining truth about aloneness. 
thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, I guess there's Marjorie Anderson. The book is called Drop Threads 3. Marjorie, thanks for putting the book together and thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for your very interesting questions. And we're going to take a short break and be back with Laurie Nielsen Glenn right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Uh, my second guest today is Laurie Nielsen Glenn. She's a contributor to the Drop Threads 3 book. She's also the Poet Laureate of Halifax. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Leslie. Now, let's talk about your contribution here. You include a story that's a conversation of sorts with a woman who offers excellent insight. Can you introduce us to her? Annie. Well, Annie is the vehicle that I wanted to use to try to distill the wisdom that I've gathered. Uh, from my students, actually, after 35 to 40 years of teaching now in various, various uh, locations, uh, you know, in university and public school and penitentiary up north, uh, and I've learned an awful lot from my students. And when I sent in a proposal for the Dropped Threads 3 collection, I thought, how can I distill all this wisdom I've gleaned from women, amazing women who have decided at some point, usually halfway through their life, that they're going to start over, they're going to do something different. And how do they do that? How, they, how have they accomplished it? So I pulled together uh, some of what I had observed uh, from them. And now, uh, so she's an amalgamation of many different people. Oh, she's the, yeah, she's the, she's the wise woman that, uh, well, the wise person in, in us all. The, uh, she's our better self. She's our more courageous self. She's the, one we, she's the voice we need to, to listen to every now and then. Right. She reminded me of my grandmother a little oh, bit. Oh, exactly. See, I had that That's kind of great. grandmother. That was her. The yes. Minnie was my grandmother's name. So there oh, she was. and what That's a great name, name, Minnie. Yes. Yes. Right. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, who is she talking to? Is she talking to you, the author? Oh, she's talking to anybody Everybody. who is, yes, presumably someone has come to visit her to, to, uh, to get some courage and advice about uh, changing her life. And so Annie, um, Annie's on a roll and she starts dispensing her wisdom. Take us there a bit. What, uh, give us some pearls of her wisdom. What kind of advice is she offering? Oh, she, first of all, she says uh, you, ha you, have to, uh, you have to obviously uh, believe in yourself. You have to have people around who are going to be willing to support you. Uh, you have to find out what your distinctive feature is. And you have to recognize, finally, we don't have that much time in the world and that we do have to pay attention to what our strengths are and to honor them. Uh, she reminds us that there are going to be people who, uh, who won't necessarily be pleased with our decision to make these changes, but to persevere nonetheless. And she reminds us, too, just to listen to, I, I, I use uh, the figure of a cat in here, Coyote, which essentially is the, is the trickster figure, it's the Hermes figure, it's the Anansi figure in, in our life. And it may not be a person, it just may be an event or a circumstance that forces us to, to, to feel shifting ground and then to make a decision to, to transform and to, to move in another direction. As she says, I, I guess it's Annie who's saying that stories change, meaning you may have one story, this has been your life and this is who you are, now it's about to change. Um, does that mean that the, the meaning of your life changes as well? Oh, I think it does. Of course the meaning of our life and the purpose in our life changes. I think we're always reinventing ourselves in some way, shape or form. I mean, life is... Uh, to use Mary Catherine Bateson's uh, term, you know, we compose our lives. And when we write down that wisdom, or when we, we speak it and we pass it along, it's an ongoing uh, process of composing our lives. And it's also, it's always in revision. Um, so dare I say that if, if the stories change, then the truth changes. What is true for you at one point in your life may not be true for you. Most definitely, road. most definitely. And the truth, our own truth, our individual truth, our social truth, our community truths, 
and our cultural truths. I mean, truths do, do change. And I think one of the things that I recognize and have learned from my students, and especially the students who come in and they're, they're first of all, in, uh, they're so in awe of, of the academy and knowledge, you know, outside knowledge, external knowledge. And sometimes uh, more so than they need to be. And not until they really get into an engagement with an idea they realize that ideas change, theories change, there is no right answer. Uh, all of this is always under review and uh, under, di you know, under discussion. And that that is all right, that that's the kind of shifting ground that allows us to, to understand things differently and to, to allow ourselves to reinvent ourselves and to, to respond to the world differently. And you're obviously very interested in the late bloomers. Who, who are they? How does that happen for, you know, the, um, women who have great achievement who begin very late in their lives? Well, I don't know. And, it, you know, it's always dangerous when you talk about this because it's, it's not as so, though every woman has chosen uh, a life of, of being married and having children and, and so on and so forth. That's, that's not the case for everybody. But it does seem to be... Um, a, a very important part of life for many women and women in one way or other are often uh, encouraged to to develop relationships and to take care of people whether it's their parent or their child or their spouse and so on and so forth and then they come to a point in life where they realize hmm maybe it's time I took care of me now what can I do uh, what do I really want to do? What is it if I, if, if I knew I were to die tomorrow, what would I regret not having done? Okay, thanks for that. My guest is uh, Laurie Nielsen Glenn. We're going to take a real short break and be back right after this. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Laurie Nielsen Glenn, one of the contributors to the Drop Threads 3 anthology. Laurie, perhaps you'd read a poem for us since you are the poet laureate of Halifax. All right. Thank you very much. I will. I will read. I'll read a poem from my upcoming collection. Its uh, collection is called Combustion, and it will be out next spring with uh, Brick Books. And this is dedicated to my brother. Our provenance, cold silence, lukewarm, cream tuna on toast every movement a mute apology. Five years difference means nothing. That we held our breath together, everything. This morning your step on the stairs to the, to the guest room so quiet I can hear the kitchen clock four decades away. So quiet I can hear your clarinet begin to call over the aspen and across the tracks and I get up, put on a fresh pot, crack eggs, chop basil, find myself humming an old prime tune about angels and living, about one thing to hold on to. What women inspire you? Oh, almost every woman I know has inspired me. My mother inspires me, my friends inspire me, my students especially inspire me. I think most every woman I've met has a kernel of wisdom that she can pass along. And just being able to have the conversation, uh, whether it's uh, over around the kitchen table, uh, in a book, uh, on the radio, on television, just to have an opportunity to have a conversation. There's always a nuance, uh, some some new insight, some uh, some glimmer of truth that that uh, gives you access to to how you know how we might live our lives. Thanks for being on the show. My guests today have been Marjorie Anderson and Laurie Nielsen Glenn, and uh, it was great to have you here. Thanks very much, Leslie. And thanks for watching the show. I'll see you again next time.